let's pray father in heaven we are so grateful to you for this time lord especially for giving us another opportunity that we brethren could come together uh, and to learn to spend time in your presence to study your word and to encourage one another lord lord the time we spend here may be a fruitful time in our lives that uh, our discussions and our uh, the teaching we are going to hear lord may strengthen us and may edify us oh god and help us to experience you more intimately and may this uh, hour we spent in your presence help us to um, experience more closely oh god and our words our meditations may be acceptable in your sight in jesus name we pray amen amen uh, what we're going to discuss today is what i have titled what saves us but it's basically going to be a study of uh, uh, these verses in the book of Galatians, uh, chapter that is from chapter 5 and beginning in verse 1 to verse 5, but we will also include verse 6, but we will explore that a little better, uh, you know, next time we have the same series. Now, the reason I, I ask this question, what saves us, uh, is a dilemma for many Christians. You know, the, the question, and, and many of people, you know, I've discussed this, uh, and uh, many times people have this doubt. You know, uh, if I'm a Christian, then um, must, must I not, or do I not have an obligation to obey God? And when they say obey, the question is, you know, I must obey the commandments of God. And what are the commandments of God? Then, you know, we get into uh, the law of God. And so, uh, you know, uh, so the question is, uh, what must I, what must I do as a Christian? How do I live my life as a Christian? Uh, do I just say that I believe in, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, you know, just living any way which, way which I like because I'm saved by Christ. If I'm not obedient, the question is, am I lost? Will Christ reject me? You know, uh, so though Christ saves me, uh, don't I have a responsibility to remain obedient. And once again, when we talk of obedience, we always think about the law. So some Christians try to solve that by, by saying, well, yes, Christ saves me, but I must also obey. And uh, otherwise, I might lose my salvation. One, uh, one cult, uh, uh, you know, so-called Christian cult, a teaching that they uh, that they believe in is the following. It says, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So in other words, uh, this teaching uh, seemed to indicate I must do something along with the grace that Jesus Christ offers me. What is it that I must do? And for some of us, who, ha who have come from the church, uh, it could be maybe Sabbath people. <laughs> you know, lots of people say, well, you know, you've got to keep the Sabbath. Or for some, it should be holy days. Uh, if I am a disciple of Christ, I have to observe the holy days. Maybe, it, it, maybe for some, it is tithing laws. Uh, and of course, there will be a whole bunch of... Uh, Christian pastors and leaders who would very strongly preach on tithing because, you know, the obvious, uh, the obvious uh, benefits from that. All right. And maybe it is prayer for somebody, Bible study for somebody, or some kind of a ritual that people would like to, uh, you know, add on to the grace of Christ. Now for the Galatians, the church, the church at Galatia, it was circumcision. If you have read the scripture, you will notice that they got hung up with circumcision. 
So what I'm going to do is we are going to look into how the Apostle Paul discusses this aspect of circumcision and the law, and we will I, I will explain that, and how he helps them to understand where is, you know, the assur assurance of their salvation. Is it in Christ or is it in Christ plus something they can do? Or is it Christ to begin with? And then later on, it all depends on us. So these are questions that we are going to answer today. But it's good for us to read uh, what we are going to study. And I'm going to just uh, show you my screen where we can probably, you can see what we are going to uh, uh, try to exegete today. If you notice on the notes there, uh, I'm presuming you can see the, uh, the wordings, Galatians 5, and it begins in verse 1 by saying, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Verse 2, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to, the, to obey the whole law. Verse 4, you, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. All right. Uh, let me take that thing off from the screen. So what is Paul trying to say? And of course, many of you will know that the church at Galatia had a problem with uh, especially Jewish Christians who came into the church uh, and were very strictly obeying the law of Moses prior to their coming into the church. And they were trying to say to the Christians there, especially those of a Gentile background, that if you are going to be a Christian, uh, then you must also obey the law of Moses. And that's where the whole circumcision thing comes in. All right. So I'm going to take verse by verse and just exegete. Uh, and then uh, we will. And then I want to make an important conclusion. And then we'll get into our discussion. So verse one says. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What is Paul saying? Paul is very clearly establishing that Jesus Christ is the source of freedom. Right? He has set us free. He is the source of freedom. Now, freedom from what? What are we free from? Well, if you read the verse uh, very clearly, the context suggests that freedom is from this yoke of slavery. He calls it the yoke of slavery. And what is this law? What is this yoke of slavery? Well, he goes on to mention circumcision. That is that becomes a yoke of slavery, especially if you're going to insist that people get circumcised as adults, you know, coming into the church, that becomes a yoke of slavery. Uh, uh, just to prove that point, in verse 3, he says, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. So circumcision is what is being the focus. Now, uh, when he talks about circumcision, what is he also talking about? He is also talking about the law, right? Reference to the whole law as given through Moses. If I can read to you from Acts chapter 15, just to show you, reference to circumcision is also reference to the entire law of Moses. 
given under Moses. Acts 15 and verse 5 says, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So you notice how the two are being connected. Circumcision and then to command them to keep the law of Moses. But once again, Christ is saying, I mean, uh, the Apostle Paul is saying, Christ has freed us from sin, right? Christ has given us freedom. Now, what is this freedom from? Obviously, it is from sin, the penalty of sin. But sin applies only because of the law, right? Law, the, the what do you say, the uh, transgression of the law is, uh, is sin. Now, if we are freed from the penalty, we are also freed from uh, sin. And if you are freed from sin, you're also freed from the law. Does that make sense? Well, it does. Notice in Galatians 2 verse 15, let me read you a verse. Uh, Galatians 2 verse 15. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. Is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So Paul makes this argument that our freedom is from the yoke of slavery. And what is the yoke of slavery? Ultimately, it's a reference to the entire law of Moses. I will show you that uh, in, in greater detail as we go along. Let's move to verse 2 of the passage that we read. Paul says, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Notice the logic that he's using. If you let yourselves to be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. You see, the choice is clear. What is the choice? It is either Christ or circumcision. Or if I can in, uh, extrapolate there, Christ or the law. Right? If it is the law, what is Paul saying? Christ profits you nothing. Right? Because you, it, it cannot be Christ plus circumcision, which means law. It cannot be Christ plus law. Why? Because you cannot add anything to Christ. Christ is not deficient. Christ is not incomplete. What Christ did for you and for me in his incarnation and ultimate ascension is not incomplete. That we have to complete something for Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying is you cannot add anything to what Christ has already accomplished for us. So his logic is, if you are standing on the ground of circumcision or underscored law, what he's saying is then you have left the ground of grace in Christ. That's as simple as it is. That's the choice we have. If we are going to insist on keeping the law, then Christ profits you nothing. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Because you cannot add something to what Christ has already done. All right. Let's move to verse 3. Verse 3 says, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Now, notice the, uh, what you say, uh, how he is bringing the law, you know, and basically circumcision is a, uh, is a uh, indication or a, it, it is reference to the whole law because he is saying, uh, those who want to be circumcised must obey the whole law. If you keep one law, then the whole law is attracted. You cannot say, I will keep one law and, uh, you know, leave out the rest. If one law is broken, and this is from the book of James, if you remember, the whole law is broken. So what Paul is saying is, 
you're not obligated to the law anymore. All right. And when I say the law, it is the entire law that was given through Moses, beginning from the Ten Commandments, right to the holy days, right to the, you know, uh, to everything that is contained in the book of Leviticus, Exodus, De Deuteronomy. Right. So let's get back to the what Paul is trying to say. Anyone, Paul is saying, who chooses circumcision or to be accepted by God through the law is actually signing up for the entire law of Moses. You cannot pick and choose. In other words, a la carte Christianity doesn't apply. I hope you understand when I say a la carte Christianity, right? When you go to a restaurant, you are given a menu. And from the menu, you can choose what you want to eat. Sorry, that's not available in the, in the Christian faith. Uh, if you want to keep the law, you cannot pick and choose. I will keep these laws and I will forget these laws. Well, and of course, we can use the New Testament saying, but you know, Jesus Christ and the apostles kept the Sabbath and kept that and kept never everything else. Uh, well, follow the logic of Paul. Paul is saying, uh, if you choose one, you are obligated to the entire law, right? What is happening is that person is asking God, when you keep one law, that person is asking God to judge him according to his works and not according to Christ's, Christ's work. He wants his work. Uh, he wants to be judged by his work, not what Christ has done for us. You see? In other words, one cannot be trying to save himself and at the same time be trusting Christ wholly for salvation. How can you say that I trust Christ, you know, for salvation, but I have to keep this law? Where is your faith? Your faith is in the law, not, not in Christ. Oh, you can say, but my faith is in both. It doesn't work that way. It, it, cannot, it cannot be in both. Because if you bring in the law, then Christ is of no value. That is what Paul is saying. Okay. Uh, Christ does not save you partly. You see? You cannot say that Christ, well, saves me, but I have to keep the law. It is it's basically saying, Christ has saved me only partly and I have to do my part. And I, according to the Erdman's Bible commentary, the two ways exclude each other. It's either the law or Christ. It's either the law or Christ. You cannot have both. There is, there is uh, Paul does not give us that indication that you have to have both. All right. So uh, just to take the logic a little bit further, we are still in verse three. When Christ is saving us, when Christ has all, you know, done his work to save us, we cannot go to Christ and say, Christ, hey, Jesus, let me, let me, you know, help you saving me. <laughs> right? I will do a little bit so that it doesn't, <laughs> you can, you, you do your part. I have to do my part. Why? I'm afraid that you may not do the whole part. Or I'm afraid you might not do a good job. Neither, if you, if you reverse the argument, uh, Christ does not come and tell you, hey, uh, you know, I've done my part. Now you do your part by obeying circumcision, Sabbath, holy days, all these things, right? Uh, it's like a drowning man, you know, maybe he's drowning and, uh, 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 and uh, Christ comes to him and says, okay, I'm going to save you. And then you turn around and say, well, you know, actually I'm drowning and you're saving me, but, uh, you know, let, let me also swim partly. You bring me close to the shore and then I'll swim the rest of the way. <laughs> see, you, I, I, I hope you can see what the kind of logic we are trying to use here. Uh, uh, Christ doesn't do that. He, he doesn't bring you half and then say, now you swim, chap. Right? He doesn't do that. He brings you all the way to the shore. Right? Because why? We were dead in our sins. 
when we were dead in our sins, Christ died for us. In other words, he assumed our death. And in our deathly state, there is nothing we can do to, to save ourselves. All right. So going back to the drowning analogy, a drowning man cannot say, well, let me help you, you know, save me. Uh, what we have to understand is you and I cannot help Christ to save us. Right? We can only accept what Christ has done for us. Keeping the law does not make it easier for Christ to save us. Some people would like to really lend our help to Christ, you know, and say, well, you know, let me, you know, let me help you, uh, you know, save me. Let me make it easier for you to save. Me. Well, th that logic doesn't work. Okay, let's go to verse four now. Verse four says, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. Wow, that's powerful words. You have fallen away from grace. I mean, notice those words. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. In other words, keeping the law or keeping circumcision or any part of the law means you don't have full confidence in Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul says, you have been alienated from Christ. If you mix the law along with Christ, you have been alienated. So those are quite serious and powerful words. Uh, some, would, some use this logic. You know, some would say, well, you have to keep the law. You, you trust in Christ for saving you, but you have to keep the law. Why? Because you have to maintain your salvation. You see, Christ saves you, but then you now have to maintain your salvation by keeping the law. It's like this uh, maintenance dose, you know. Uh, those of you who have uh, taken homeopathy. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure some of you believe in homeopathy, but... Uh, the homeopathy doctors will say, you see, uh, now you, you take this, but you have to do maintenance, you know, your maintenance job has to be done. So they'll give you a maintenance dose for life. So you keep on taking that. So you maintain your health. And so that is the logic. Sometimes some people use Christ has saved me, but I have to maintain my salvation through obedience to the law. Well, Paul says, if you have begun with Christ, if you have begun with Christ, then in halfway down the line, you can say, I have no need for Christ now because now I'm keeping the law. You see, you, once again, uh, you cannot depend on yourself. The question I have to ask is, what is maintaining your salvation? Is it your maintenance dose of keeping the law? Is it the Sabbath and the holy days or circumcision that is maintaining you to keep to, to remain safe? The entire maintenance is Christ. We live and move and have our being in, in him. He is maintaining our salvation. And he is the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because he wants to make sure that he is, you know, taking you home all the way through. So, Either Christ is your savior or you have no savior at all. Either Christ is your savior or the law is your savior. You have to decide which. That's the, that's the argument Paul is making. Right? Jesus Christ did not sign up to be a part-time savior. Right? He is not a part-time savior. He is a full-time savior. And if he's full-time, all the laws that you can keep is not going to save you and neither going to maintain your salvation. That is where faith comes. In. And of course, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So we'll move to verse five. now. Verse five says, for through the spirit, we eagerly await by faith, the righteousness for which we hope. Now, Paul brings in the Holy Spirit and the importance of the spirit guiding us, leading us, being in us, 
And then it talks about a righteousness that is, uh, uh, that is true and by faith. What Paul is saying here is righteousness is a gift of God. It is not something we achieve on our merit or on our effort. Uh, we don't achieve righteousness of, our, our, of ourselves. And if you think you have achieved some righteousness by your, by your efforts, may I remind you what, who is it, Isaiah? Who says, is it Isaiah? Uh, I, I didn't make that reference. Uh, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah. Uh, yes, Isaiah says, your righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags. Right? So, uh, what is the righteousness that we need? I'll read you another verse. Galatians 2.21, it says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Christ died for nothing. You and I cannot, you know, uh, manufacture our own righteousness. So, it is through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. That righteousness is imputed to us. It is given to us in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Right? Uh, Jesus, otherwise, Jesus Christ died for nothing. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. So let's complete then. Verse 6 and verse 6, I'm going to leave it hanging a bit because I want to take this up uh, another time when we can complete the thought, right? We are basically trying to say Christ and the law, you cannot mix both. You either have a full-time savior because Christ is not your part-time savior. Verse 6 says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. All right. So any amount of keeping the law, when it says circumcision, it is the whole law. Paul says, has no value for us in the sense of salvation. It has no, uh, what you say, it doesn't attribute to you any kind of value towards salvation. And he, then he talks about faith expressing itself through love. Faith must express itself through love, in other words. In other words, what, Christ, what Paul is saying is the essence of Christianity is a personal relationship to Jesus Christ, which is manifested in faith. And that faith is expressed in love. That's why the Apostle James says, faith without works is dead. Right? Now, we have to understand it's in the context. Uh, when that faith is mentioned, it's obviously expressed here, as Paul says, in love. We will talk about that a little bit more a little later. Uh, okay. So, uh, if I can sort of bring this to a conclusion, it says, what we have to understand is there is no room for the law when we are in Christ. There is no room for the law when we are in Christ. The question is, do you have, are you in Christ? Are you in the faith that uh, given by the Holy Spirit, you know, and completely holding on to Christ for, you know, that ultimate relationship and salvation that we have in. Right. Uh, now, for that, we want, to, we want to discuss what Paul says, then how do you live your lives? You see, if, you are, if, you, if we are told that the law is of, you know, you cannot add law, what then should we do? That's a big question that, you know, a lot of Christians struggle with. Uh, so we want to discuss that because the Apostle Paul talks about that. And I will take up that. And that is the later half of Galatians chapter 5. You could read it. Uh, and in preparation, we can discuss that when we take it up next. But I want to leave you with one very important point. All of this discussion we have had very clearly shows 
It's only in Christ we have salvation. No ritual, no obedience to the law, no being good, no being nice, uh, no being uh, courteous. Uh, all of those things are not contributing to salvation. You're, you're being saved. Though those things are nice to do in, in one sense, but then that doesn't contribute to your salvation. And here is the point I want to make. That salvation is only in Christ. That is the reason why the Bible says, and Christians, we Christians say, salvation can only be in Christ. There is nothing that we can do to save us. No ritual. You can do everything, you know, uh, in terms of ritualistic practices that doesn't save us. That is the reason why the Bible is so bold to say that salvation is only found in Christ. Let me read you Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, some people are offended by that. We say, oh, you know, I mean, uh, are you saying that Christianity is so exclusive that only in Christ you can be saved? Yes, that's what we are saying. Why are we saying it? Because of what we have read. You can, you can have 666 laws or you can observe all the rituals and you can do all the prayer and Bible study and fasting you want and all the Sabbath keeping and the holy days you want. You can do everything. It will not save you. Only Christ saves you because we are dead. Only Christ has life. He is the author of salvation, our salvation. He is the author of our lives. Uh, so only in Christ we can be saved. That's the reason why Acts chapter 4 very clearly says that there is no other name on the heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, once again, you might be, you know, uh, tempted to ask, what do I do then? Do I do nothing? Do I just say, oh, Christ has come, then I can just go and do what I want. Uh, if I'm not supposed to be observing the law, what uh, am I supposed to do so that I don't get rejected? Because they, you will always remember that there are scriptures that say that some are going to be rejected from being in the kingdom. Uh, the goats and the sheep will be divided and the goats will go to eternal damnation. The sheep will be sent to eternal life. What about that? What, how, how do I make sure I'm not one of the goats? <laughs> right? Or you might remember the parable of the, of the, uh, of the net, the dragnet, which caught all kinds of fish. And the parable says then, you know, some fish were good and some fish were bad and they were thrown out while the good fish was collected. So you might say, is there anything I must do to make sure I am the good fish? Right? So these are some things we will discuss in the next time, but I want to make it very clear and to answer the question that I asked in the post, what saves us? Right? I hope you can answer that question. Okay, I'm going to stop there and let's get into our discussion. Thank you very much. All right, questions, comments? Uh, was it, uh, I mean, I've taken just that section in Galatians 5. There are many other scriptures you can add and bring a very, uh, bring absolute clarity that only Christ saves us. Bertram, you had a thought. Uh, Ms. Zechariah, uh, Surya Murthy, uh, some time ago had a question about this law. And uh, I'm not sure whether he was uh, satisfied with your answer, uh, but it may be good if Suryamurthy can just mention it again. Well, Suryamurthy, Bertram is asking a question on your behalf. <laughs> Would you like? No, no. So let Suryamurthy mention the question, and uh, he 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 had a question. Remember last time, Suryamurthy. <laughs> He's on mute. Surimuthi and mute. Yeah. Can you uh, hear me? Yes. yes.
I think it was about the definition of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. Right. So you are referring to the footnotes uh, in the Net Bible where they have used some word. Yeah. If you use that word correctly without uh, the way in which they had translated the word was not correct. Okay. It is referring to the uh, five books of Moses. Sin is the transgression of the law. The Greek word they have used, they have translated here differently. But in the Old Testament, they had different, they had uh, translated differently. That was the question. Okay, I'm not sure how that uh, uh, figures in our uh, discussion today. No. If you want to clarify something, I'm, I'm, you know, we can discuss it. No, I don't think that has anything to do with today's Okay. With today's okay. So uh, basically, we are discussing Paul and how he has described uh, the problem at the church in Galatia who were mixing law and Christ. And uh, Paul is, I think it should be very, he's very categorical and should be clear to you what he is trying to say. So if you have any thoughts on that, please uh, feel free to ask. Yes, Anil, yes, you had a thought? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, when we say we don't, don't have to keep the law and rituals and rites, I think one needs to probably understand that the moral law of God is still in, in uh, action. I mean, you can't say, okay, now I can uh, commit adultery, I can murder and so on. Yeah. The point is that, yes, these all these things, if you keep, it will still not save you. It will only your belief and, uh, you know, uh, in, in Jesus Christ that saves you. But in any case, the moral law you still have to keep. Or as some people say, well, the your faith in Christ will lead you into doing this good thing, which is also fine. But uh, some people might think that, okay, now we don't have to keep the law. It means, yeah, we can keep on sinning. But that's not the point, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> that's not the point. And that's the reason why I want to have a second part to this, where we talk about uh, what Paul would, uh, how in wo uh, the words of Paul, he shows us the responsibility that we have as disciples of Jesus. Uh, when we have faith in Christ, it obviously leads you to express that faith. Now, how do you express that faith is something he talks about in the, in the rest of the discussion in Galatians 5. We will we'll come to that. But if I can just mention this thing about this moral law and ritualistic law, uh, you know, this, this, this whole thing again confuses us. Uh, if I can just say, when we refer to the law, there is no distinction between moral and ritual. Uh, we have to understand when the Bible is referring to the law, it lumps the whole thing together. See, this is where I think where we tend to get confused and tend to think that, you know, the moral law continues. And what do we lump into that moral law? Well, 10 commandments. And when we talk about the 10 commandments, what are we talking about? Sabbaths. That's how we argue, right? We argue by saying 10 commandments are, you know, was never done away because Christ talked about that. Now, if, if we need to interpret these things correctly so that we understand exactly how Christ uh, looked at those things, obviously we don't have time today. But when you bring in this moral and ritualistic, then we have to be very careful. Uh, uh, that is not what Paul is saying. Uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, Shanti, go ahead. Uh, you had a thought. Yes, uncle. Uh, uh, I wanted to bring about two, uh, two things. Uh, one was about, uh, you know, 
uh, indeed uh, the law uh, you know when we say law then there is no place for grace at all and uh, that is so, so, so true and uh, we do serve a lord who has given us complete salvation not part not in uh, the end, ending not only uh, you know as an opening push but a complete salvation he has given us so i wanted to bring about one and i added layer to that that uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it the um, the scriptures tell us that love covers a multitude of sins in first peter 4 8 yeah it says love covers a multitude of sins and we know god is love christ is love he covers a multitude of sins so that means where the law doesn't forgive a few things but when we come in love in christ we come then the the entire thing just opens up for us as uh, you know, people who have repented that things that do not get covered under the law that, oh, you are a sinner suddenly turns into no worries. You have come back to me. And so I will, uh, you know, I will free you from this. And um, then, of course, later on, it goes off into uh, John 14, 15 says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And his two Two commandments that he sums up is love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord with all your heart, your mind and soul. So this entirety covers everything that the law says that do this, do that. Everything is covered in these two. So what are we saying in, in together? If in we are in Christ, then the law doesn't portray itself at all because God is love. So when we say, talk about love, where does law come from? It is like, if I love my dad, my and my dad is saying, you will love me and you can love me only if you do this, 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 this. Otherwise, you don't love me. Does that convey the entire emotion? It doesn't. So it seems a bit silly actually to talk that, you know, about law still being right now there. Uh, you know, because Christ is love and that law has been changed into love. Um, this is one point that I wanted to bring about. And the second one I wanted to say was there are many people who take the uh, what do you call it? This particular verse in saying in rather um, in giving more um, credence about, you know, we have to work out salva work salvation. You have to work for your salvation. In that regard, I wanted to bring uh, Philippians 2.12. Many people quote this and say, Wherefore, my beloved, I'm reading Philippians 2 verse 12. Uh, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. They bring this and they say, oh, you have to work for your salvation. You know, every day you have to work at it and things like that. So uh, I wanted to bring uh, this particular verse because many people use this for giving credence to that kind of a talk. But there's a difference between working for our salvation and working out our salvation. There is a, a huge difference because our salvation is a gift. It has been freely given. So we cannot work for our salvation. It has already been given to us. And so what we have received freely as a gift, we can only work it out by bringing out all that we have received within, meaning those beautiful traits, you know, the beautiful traits, the beautiful attributes by faith, we can bring it in reverence to the Lord when it says in fear and trembling. But uh, so uh, just wanted to just also observe and say that people use this verse also for uh, communicating, oh, you have to be, you know, everyday work uh, to be saved at the end of the day. Yes, uh, Shanti, thank you very much. I know some of these verses are uh, troublesome and uh, it is interpreted in, in ways that can again confuse us. But uh, I think uh, when you talk about love, uh, you know, there is, <laughs> yes, it, it, it really encompasses so much. And I think it is again Paul who says, love is the fulfill fulfillment of the law. Uh, so, uh, what we have to understand is, yes, there is something we ought to, I mean, we have to dedicate ourselves to, and that we will discuss next time. But then uh, 
Uh, the problem many a times is, well, what do we do then with the Sabbath? What do we do with the holy days? What do we do with this and that and all the other things? That is where I think confusion still reigns. And there are people who continue to say, oh, you know, if you don't keep the Sabbath, you're out of the kingdom. Vanessa, you had a thought. Uh, that's that's true what you are saying about uh, the Sabbath day and all uh, other uh, lawful things that we are told to do. Like, uh, as I said, that being a Catholic, brought up in a Catholic community and a home. So we were taught that at the um, uh, Lent, Lent time that you are supposed to make a sacrifice and you're not supposed to eat meat and for 40 days and uh, those sort of things we were taught. So I remember when I first joined your church in I think 2020 or something. So I had come, uh, I was coming to your church on Sundays and uh, whenever you had. So I remember that it was uh, the first, that Lent period on, on a Friday or, or Sunday. And it was the second Sunday when you'll have lunch. So. Vanessa, <laughs> uh, so you've gone on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, <laughs> From when I was on mute, I don't remember. Okay. So it was the second Saturday when you were having the lunch and it was Lent time. So of course I was partaking with you all for the lunch. And I remember at our table, uh, there were uh, some of them and of course i did not take meat because i was taught at lent time don't eat meat but then all the others were having meat so i remember that parveen had come and joined me and sat beside me and that was the first lunch i i was sitting with everyone so he asked me are you a vegetarian so i said no i'm a non-vegetarian so he said then why aren't you taking meat so i i told him that it is lent time and uh, not so he said then he explained to me that uh, it is it is just uh, the law it is nothing like this that you don't have to eat meat or you don't have to do and i i remember him explaining to me nicely that these were just uh, lawful things that uh, we had to do so now I realize after your after getting into your church and coming to know so much more uh, minutely and into the Bible of what you can and what is lawful things and not lawful things and what what you just have to have faith. You don't have to follow the law by doing certain things. So I try as much as possible, of course, to explain these things and tell my children and my daughter-in-laws and my friends that... Uh, all these things that we were taught, these lawful things, that it is not necessary in our lives. It is not going to get us anywhere closer to the Almighty or to Jesus. So this is one thing nice that I was, I mean, put into, I came to know. So, I mean, I am also trying to teach others the same thing. The Catholic people that I know, of course, all of them. So it's nice to know all these things. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing with us uh, your experience. And I'm glad that we were able to help you uh, understand, uh, you know, uh, these rituals are, are, are not biblical. They are man-made. And so obviously, we, uh, for us, the scriptures come above man-made rituals and practices. But when you mentioned lunch, uh, it just made me feel hungry. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, any other thoughts? Bertram, go ahead. Yeah. Bertram and then Anil. Ms. Zachariah, in Isaiah 30, verse 15, I find it very, uh, very true. It mentions, uh, uh, just to quote the scripture, it says, For thus says the Lord God, uh, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved uh, in quietness and trust or in quietness and confidence, shall be your strength. Uh, I find it very straightforward and true in our lives as Christians, in having the living faith, uh, being dead, uh, being baptized, and uh, made enlivened again, receive the Holy Spirit, and receive the faith of Christ, and we live a Christian life in our relationship, which expresses itself in love. <clears throat> Thank you, Bertie. I think that's a very, uh, very pertinent verse. Thank you for sharing it. Anil, you had a thought. 
No, I, I keep coming back to this when, you know, when people say, okay, so now you don't have to observe the law, observe the law prices and everything. The, then the confusion comes in that, okay, so now I can do whatever I want. But what is important to understand is you don't have to observe the law to secure your salvation. It okay. doesn't lead anything, but you still have to do all those good things for an ordered society. So, you know, people keep saying, oh, fine. So now we don't have to observe the law. It is abolished and now Christ is everything. So that okay. might put into people's mind that, okay, now I can go on uh, sinning and uh, well, Christ has assured my salvation. But the point is that the law doesn't help you in securing your salvation. That's what I wanted to emphasize. And I, I'm sure people understand that, but I think yeah. it needs repetition perhaps. Yeah, I think uh, what you're saying is, you know, once again, the usual, uh, what do you say, uh, confusion that people have, uh, you know, that if we now uh, live under grace, we can go and live like the devil. Uh, <laughs> but that is not what Paul is saying. Very clearly in verse 6, he says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And we need to unpack that. So obviously, Paul does not mean that freedom from the law is license to license to live any way which you like. Uh, so that he makes very clear as we go along. But how do we understand those things that we do? It is not the law of Moses that we are referring to. It, in, 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 uh, if I can use this, it is the law of love. Because God is love. God is our law, right? Because he is love. And hence, our law becomes uh, God. And our faith in him is expressed through that love. So once again, all of these things we need to bring together. So yes, I completely agree that, uh, you know, we can't go and uh, uh, live profligate lives just because we are now under in freedom, the freedom from the law. Uh, Surya Murthy, yes, you had a talk. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. We are talking about law and faith in Christ. Uh, you forget the law. Somewhere in the New Testament, I don't remember the verses. It says, if you don't behave properly, your faith in Christ is, is in vain. It's not even talking about the law. Even if you don't be, behave properly, your faith in Christ is in vain. So I don't remember the verse. Next, next week, I'll tell you the okay. verse and explain it. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's a very good point, Surya Murthy. Uh, you know, I mean, when we talk about, you said behavior, you know, the, our behavior in Christ goes much beyond the law. <laughs> if you look at the law of Moses, what Christ is wanting us to understand and live by goes beyond the law. Uh, and so what you said was absolutely right. If we, if we are not cognizant of those things, uh, then our entire Christianity is compromised. Uh, and we, become, we become a shame for Christ. Bertie, you were saying something? You're on mute, Bertie. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, it goes beyond the letter of the law, and we live in the new way of the spirit. Okay, well, that's another way of putting it. Yes. Yes. Shanti, go ahead. I think uh, when Uncle Anil is talking about uh, what he said, he was speaking about Romans 6.15, yeah, Uncle. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be, right? It's so true that we could take our, I mean, usually we're very, very fast to, uh, talk about grace and love and all of this but we do sometimes also forget it i guess it's a it's a topic for another day maybe an extension of this but we do 
forget to also talk about that there is a place for the the wrath of God. There is a place for the fear or the reverence of the Lord. That yeah. we can't just do things, yes. But it is, I think, an extension of this. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And, and that's good. We can continue to discuss that. And I think, Franklin, I'm very sorry. It looks like you wanted to speak. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I, if I, forgot, I missed, missed you. Go ahead. Sir, sir today's passage uh, talks about the sufficiency and exclusivity of Christ for salvation. Am I correct, sir? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's different ways of putting it. Yes. Okay, sir. Sure. But sir, then, sir, as Shanti Ma'am uh, Ma pointed out, the component of love, no, sir, we have to bring the component of love, sir, because sir, Moses gave 613 laws. Micah reduced it to just three, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And Christ reduced it to the two greatest commandments. So what is an order, sir? You have to unpack the concept of love. Okay. How does love, sir, how does, how does love uh, tie up with the sufficiency and exclusivity of Christ? Okay. Yes, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that Micah reduced it to three and Christ reduced it to two. Two. If I can just say Christ actually reduced it to only one. <laughs> Galatians 5.14. <laughs> okay. Love other right. is here, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we'll, we'll, if we have time, we can bring some of those, uh, you know, extended talks. But thank you so much. I think time has gone by. Surya Murthy, mm -hmm. you want to say something? You are quoting that verse. There is no name under heaven. Yes. What is that verse? Acts chapter 15, it says, uh, um, sorry, uh, not Acts chapter 15. It is Acts chapter 4. Uh, For there is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Uh, name given. Name given. Yes. So, what was the name given? The name given, somebody is arguing. The name given is Yeshua. <laughs> oh, here we go with the name controversy now. <laughs> so, so, the name given is Yeshua. It was not uh, uh, Jesus. So, what is the name given? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that brings in another can of worms. <laughs> what we'll do is, uh, if we want to discuss that, I think we will really need time to unpack it another time. Can we do that another time, Asuri Murthy? Yeah. Okay. All right. Bertie, then uh, we'll close uh, after your comment, and you can lead us in a closing prayer. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, what Mr. Poppet mentioned, he quoted was from Micah, Prophet Micah, uh, Book of Micah, where the Lord says, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, to man he says, uh, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Yeah. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Let's pray. Yeah. After God, we just give our grateful thanks to you, Lord, for this time together. Uh, it's you who makes possible, Lord. We're grateful for your spirit guiding us, leading us, and Lord, to have knowledge of the scriptures. Your word, Lord, endures throughout all generations. Your law, your word is truth. We rejoice, Lord, uh, uh, teaching us these things so that we get clarity, uh, we get instruction, we get correction, we get comfort of the scriptures, Lord. It is your word that sustains us. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us the truth and that uh, uh, Christ is uh, sufficient to us, Lord, for uh, he has done the finished work on the cross. We bless and praise and thank you, Lord, for your mercies to each of us, for your grace, Lord, which uh, uh, gives us access through faith to this righteousness, Lord, in which we live and which will suffice us, Lord, throughout uh, eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for using Zechariah to teach us and lead us. Continue to use, uh, Lord, lead him by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Bless him and his family as also all the others who attended uh, are present and those not able to be with us all and our families, Lord, so that uh, we be uh, living uh, and, uh, and confessing, Christ, and 
depending on Christ, Lord, in our lives. Lord, let your word fill us, Lord. Help us to be, uh, Lord, truly, uh, Lord, with our heart serving you wholeheartedly, Lord. And we bless and praise you. Thank you, Father. And bring us again for the next Bible study, Lord, where we grow and, Lord, perceive and, and, and live, Lord, and do good works which comes through Christ in us, Lord. Uh, blessed be your name. We pray this, Father, in Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name. Amen.